Uh, orthodox worlds like this one, which are removed from the... Uh, they wouldn't say those things in Brooklyn. Right. Um, but in Bubba, they were very sensitive to that. The Bubba Rebbe himself, he had to hide out as a Christian kid. He was thrown over the gates. His father died. So they had a very strong uh, sympathy to uh, to the Shoah. They, they consciously flipped a lot of their nigunim. They had, they had there's a famous um, the Shabbat song that they sing. I mean, think about this. Every Shabbat they think mm -hmm. about it. So they, they had a Shabbat song. Uh, they had a menucha for Simcha for Shabbat and a menucha for Simcha tune for menucha for Simcha for Yantiv. What's menucha? It's a, one of the Shabbats in Europe. Get out your NCSY venture. <laughs> It's okay, we don't need to. Menucha v'simcha. So they had two tunes, and um, they the one that the one that was for Shabbat and the one that was for Shabbos that was not also on the Yanto. Mm -hmm. And I knew this even as a little kid. The um, the tunes the things were flipped after the war because the Rebbe said that um, every Shabbat that the Jews keep after the Holocaust is a Yanto. Ah. Oh. And uh, just another example. Supposedly, the the um, the um, wedding song that they play, yeah. very famous wedding nigun, above of wedding nigun that they use, yeah, is um, suppose the way that the tune goes and the way that it sounds. Mm -hmm. It was the tune. Supposedly, it was came to him when he was in the lager in the camps. Mm. And he heard the rain dripping on the tin roof. So, it, so whether it's true or not, I don't know. But that's like, as a kid, that's what you know. And that's so the tune they play at wedding was written in the was written by the Rebbe in the log in the concentration camp or the work camps in the lager. Did he blame the Shoah on Reform Judaism? No. He didn't. They don't say stupid things like that. Um, we're rolling, by the way. Yeah, that's okay. Um, he didn't say stupid things like that. What a, the only I, guy who said that, the only the only person who said uh, the Satmarov? No, no. The only no, the only person who oh, said Abigdor that was Abigdor Miller. Well, Abigdor Miller, we can leave Abigdor Miller. Uh, if you say the Rav didn't have any influence, and Abigdor Miller, Miller had left le even less. There was a time when, like, you know, you read Abigdor Miller and Kahana and all that stuff, like in the late '60s, early '70s. Um, but it was more like. You really wanted to get pissed off. And Victor Miller is like pornography for Orthodox Jews, like kosher pornography. It's like <laughs> it's got a like it's got a shot to it. It's like it gives a thrill and a less a thrill and a charge. It's it's Gonzo Musser. What's it? I know what Musser means. What's Gonzo mean? Oh, I don't know. That was one of those like weird phrases they use. Like it's crazy stuff. Like uh, Hunter Thompson, Gonzo. Oh, Gonzo, Gonzo. Okay. Okay, I thought you were using some esoteric Yiddish word. No, I'm using some esoteric New York pronunciation. <laughs> I'm from Queens, damn it. <laughs> okay, so do most Haredim blame the Shoah on Reform Judaism? You know, I've never taken a survey. I don't think so. I think the the in Babov in, in the Hasidic world, in the in the spiritual world, the, even in Chabad. Yeah. Uh, the the take is that um, they go back to the Gemara Menachot. And they, they understand that things we can't comprehend. It doesn't make sense. The argument doesn't make sense. I mean, the secular Jews escaped the Shoah. German Jews were able to escape. American Jews were unaffected. So if God wanted to smite the reform, he didn't do it. I heard a, when I was in Mirror, in the Mirror Yeshiva in Yerushalayim, one of the Russian Yeshiva said it was the, it was the arrogance of the Yeshiva world. I mean, really? Yeah, uh, you could say anything you want. Right, right. I mean, you know, the data supports right. that more. Why, why right. would that be more surprising? I mean, if Rabbi Akiva's, all the greatest Talmud that ever happened in history, according to the Gemara, were killed because of, uh, because they didn't respect one another. So why is it more preposterous to, to say that the, uh, that the Shiva world, it was the Shiva world's fault? Now, obviously, I don't believe that. That's right. retarded, right? But <laughs> one thing is, uh, it's very noble quality of Jews is that when misfortune strikes them, they turn inward and say, "What did we do wrong to uh, well, that's bring not about this misfortune?" That that's generally true, and I think that's true. That that's the case of what most of the Hasidic writings on the Shoah are. And the reason I'm thinking about it is because I'm going to read you one in a, today. 
Okay, go ahead. Not right now. Okay. We'll, we'll get to it. But in store is a is a very poignant reading by the H. Kodesh, so it's in my mind. But um, but that's turning inward. So yes, uh, that that's the usual approach. We that's don't know. The we don't know. Approach. We don't know we, what the reason is. But those guys are ourselves. blaming other people. Right. So in other words, they're saying that because of. Uh, you know Moses Mendelssohn and his attempt to create uh, Vernunf, you know, reason as as a role for Judaism. And I'm not reformed, of course. Never been, not even sympathetic. But I've never. But um, you know, the idea of blaming the death, the the burning alive of a million children on on a theological dispute is just beyond horrible. Um, and sure. again, uh, like I say, you know, they weren't. The, that wasn't the world that was destroyed. So it's, it's hard to, if you want to argue from evidence, that argument doesn't go from evidence. So what what book do you have there? I have a lot. I've got all kinds of stuff. Oh, you know what? I was, because this is my, probably my last week in a while. Yeah. Unless I come back. I mean, I'm coming back in August for a couple of things. So maybe we can get together. But it was interesting that, um, you know, there's no accidents. Everything happens for a reason and a purpose. So Friday night I opened a Sefer. And uh, I was learning it, and well, it answered two comments by Luke Ford. Great, that's her. So first of all, let me see if I can find this other reference. I'm not sure I'll find it. Uh, but even your joke about Kivrat HaTa'ava, I saw a teaching. What was my joke? Well, What's you said you key? wanted to go there. You forget key would? You know, look, look, you know, if you want to succeed in this business, you have to remember your own writings and saying, so Kibar Tava was like the place where the Jews sinned on um, sexual matters. Oh, and with Bob Paul. Yeah. I just want to go there for journalistic reasons. I want to make that clear. What? I just wanted to go there for journalistic reasons. <laughs> so that I could document all the wrongdoing and Jewish people could have easier access to be able to take care of so we know what the, we know it's Yeah, so we know who our real to real it against. Um, because, you know, Enemies. If, if we get into, like, you know, strip clubs and deep sexual situations, we may start to believe in evolution. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that saw that, I saw that story. Um, this, uh, this, this very pious shit who happened to be at a strip club and getting a lap dance, <laughs> and his stripper started talking to him about evolution, and uh, she challenged him to go read the works of Charles Darwin, and he, he read the works of Charles Darwin, and he kept studying, and he started applying his studies to his life, and he became secular. So, I mean, we're, as no, Jews, we're supposed to you, uh, welcome truth from any source. I have a even from dancers. Did you see, I have a um, a teaching on that uh, about the donkey of Bilam. Okay. That's exa no. I mean, that's exactly the point. Rav Cohen says that that uh, the, the message there is that uh, truth comes even from the mouth of the donkey. Hmm. So, what did you want to read there? So I wanted to answer you. I just wanted. I came across a reference. He's okay. talking about something else entirely. Mm -hmm. But um, I said, "Oh my God, here it is." So um, he says, uh, "Why is it important to get to Kibbutz Tava?" <laughs> he said that in the Kabbalistic writings, you know, they always like, you, you know how how it works. It's wonderful stuff. If you ever read the Zohar or any of those things, everything is decoded, right? Everything um, everything takes on another meaning. It stands for something. You can look almost like it's a mathematical replacement of one thing for another, based on either numerical values or the meaning of the word or, or some hint or something. So uh, apparently, uh, the Baal Shem Tov said that chachma, wisdom, mm -hmm. which is the high, uh, highest formal level in the Kabbalah, right? uh, chachma and bina are the high pair. Yes. So uh, chachma is called kivaratava. Yeah. Why? 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 Because um, when a person comes to Chachma, when a person reaches that level, that level of Chachma, of understanding, this is beyond Plato, that degree. As bitel mimenu kol tavod agashmiyot azarot, rak l'tzorach kiyum adam ba'olam azeh. Because Chachma is the kivrod tava. True understanding of reality is the burial ground of tava, of, of incorrect loss. Wow. Actually, that, that Did I score a point today? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Because yeah. like, things kind of align, and things like some things drop and other things rise in importance to yeah. you as you go through life, and you attain certain understandings, and so you can be changed in a 